Sam Rodriguez, wingman, best Latino buddy, Taco Bell aficionado. I think of myself as the best Anglo buddy. You know, this is completely correct. I mean, in more, many ways, in, in so many pigmentation. Man, this is this is daring faith. Ken Harrison, Sam Rodriguez, you are what you believe. Your belief system, what you believe about yourself, what you believe about God, uh, culture, politics, family, eternity. You are your worldview, without a doubt. There is angst, Ken, right now. The issue of watered-down Christianity, the abandonment of biblical orthodoxy. We are living, arguably, without getting into eschatology today. This this question, in light of what's happening in Israel, are we living in the last days? Well, when Israel became a nation in 1948, the Bible talks about the fact that when God's children come back to their land of promise, it's the beginning of the end. And then 2 Timothy chapter 3, the great apostasy, the great falling away, heresy. Much of that heresy takes place when we are not solid as it pertains to our worldview. What is our worldview? What do you believe as a Christian? Really, what guides you? If your worldview is dictated by a television news network, we have issues. If it's dictated by the political platform of one particular party or another, we have issues. If it's fluid and it lacks some sort of solid foundational framework, we have issues. You have an incredible guest who will help us understand what a worldview actually is and how we can solidify a Christian worldview that stems out of biblical truth. Yeah, one of the reasons that I'm going to have Jeff introduce himself in a minute, um, it's very important that Christians understand not only truth, but what are the attacks on truth? Because Satan's always looking to lie, and he's been doing it for the for the entire history of mankind. He knows very well how to lie, to get in and create doubts. One of the ways we counter that is by knowing what those lies are before he tells them to us, and especially helpful for our kids and our friends, so that we want to make sure the first time they heard that lie isn't from someone who's trying to lie to them, but from someone who's trying to give them the truth. Brilliant. So, Jeff... Tell us, um, tell us about Summit Ministries, uh, what you do. I'm such a huge fan of you, of what you do there. And then I want to get right into this. Yeah, well, Ken and Sam, great to be with you. The Summit Ministries program equips and supports the rising generation to embrace God's truth and to champion a biblical worldview. We do that through programs and curriculum. We were able to influence about 70,000 young people every year through intensive courses of study. The, probably the, the most well-known aspect of what we do takes place here where my office is located in a little hippie town called Manitou Springs, Colorado. It's a, a very new, very new age little town. And right in the middle, we have uh, an antique hotel called the Grandview Hotel that we own and operate here, as well as, uh, you know, cabins and other other places where people can come and stay and learn a biblical worldview. And and I came to this program as a student. That's how I ended up here as president. I was a high school student who decided that I'm going to graduate from church when I graduate from high school because I did not see how a biblical worldview or the Bible or Christianity or going to church has anything to do with what is really important. So I, my parents somehow found out about this two-week program founded by Dr. David Noble in, here in Colorado, uh, 1962, and they sent me out here, and I, I met the guy, the founder, David Noble. I said, man, I hope you have a lot of answers because I have a lot of questions. I was just that intense, and enough to be rude to a, an older adult. He said, look, we're not afraid of questions at Summit. And I thought, I have found my tribe the first time in my life I've met Christians who are not afraid of big questions. So that program had a huge influence on my life. It's through the Summit Ministries program that I came to faith in Jesus Christ. And we've now had the opportunity to train more than 800,000 young people in a biblical worldview. Just one little program that's faithful over time has been able to help turn the tide of our nation uh, by by any good measure, we should be in the United States right now where Europe was 20 years ago. And and we're not. The truth still has an opportunity to be heard here. And so we're excited to continue the work, and especially with the rising generation that still, you know, still today seems to have lost the plot of what is actually true and how can we know. So the brilliant thing you do, a lot of what you do is 
you take high school seniors, and they don't have to be high school seniors, right? But they, that, that age group, they could be freshmen or sophomores in college. But you're bringing them in there for a course, very intensive course for two weeks. They're in Colorado, south of Colorado Springs, or also, I think, in Georgia. Yes, and yeah, look, I'm out in Georgia, too. And then they can do it online as well. But you're teaching them all the garbage they're about to hear in college and then refuting all the arguments before they ever hear them so they don't get to college and have the crisis of faith, right? And now, uh, yeah, but yeah. That, my first question to you is, what's your website? Because lots of people just said, I have to get that. I, I gotta get <laughs> if you've got a young adult, 16 to 22 years of age, you want to get them here. They'll meet Christian thought leaders, people who, who've studied and served in academia, I have a doctor of philosophy degree. Most of the people who are speaking here have doctorates in, in their field of expertise in science, theology, economics, or what have you. And they love Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. So the 16 to 22-year-olds come. By the time they leave, 96% say they have a biblical worldview, as opposed to 1% of their peers in the United States. 1%. Okay, and we... So. We follow them over time, one year, five years, 10 years out. We survey our students every year to get that long-term view. 85% stay solid in a biblical worldview. So my question to pastors or parents is, if you knew a program like that existed and could have that kind of impact, would you not do everything possible? Would you not move heaven and earth to make it possible for young adults to participate in something like this? First question I have is, do, does Islam and Christianity worship the same God? <laughs> Let's take the easiest question first, right? <laughs> this, this. Uh, uh, so there are two possibilities here: Islam and Christianity worship uh, that that this is the same God. That one of them must be worshiping falsely, mm. or they are different gods. So it's very difficult to know the answer to that. What we can know is that Islam and Christianity have a significantly different understanding of what God is like, who Jesus is, what Jesus did on earth and what, why that matters, whether the Bible is the primary document we should turn to for understanding truth, and then ultimately what it even means to be human. So we, l let me just dive into that for just a second because Christianity is... If you take Protestants, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, put them all together, you've got more than 2 billion people on the planet. That would make Christianity the largest religion. Uh, what those three groups have in common is a belief in God the Father, Jesus the Son, who rose from the dead, and the, and the Holy Spirit. There are differences in church government, obviously differences in doctrinal points here and there. But then Islam would be second, and a, a pretty close second, close to 2 billion people in the world would be Muslim. Islam goes back to the Quran, which is a, a book of testimonies that were given uh, according to the prophet Muhammad by the angel Gabriel. So they are thought to be the direct words of God sort of transcribed to the prophet Muhammad. Uh, Muslims believe that the Quran sealed God's word, that this is the last and final and best revelation of God, and that the prophet Muhammad is the best prophet, the one who told the most truth, even though other prophets and, and, and Muslims believe Jesus was one of the prophets, they came to kind of guide people toward the truth. Uh, Muslims do not believe that human beings bear the image of God. They, they hold primarily, if you read the Quran, that human beings are slaves of God. They do not believe that God revealed himself in a way that we can really know and understand. Well, the, the Quran testifies that God is merciful. The only other things we can know about God from the Quran are that are, are based in his law. So you can't know God personally. You just know what he commands you to do, and you do it. Uh, the Islam, the, the word means submission. So a Muslim is one who submits to God, and the Quran teaches that every person who has ever been born was born a Muslim. If you're not Muslim now, it is because you're in rebellion against God. And the process of ceasing your rebellion against God, interestingly enough, is called jihad. That is the term used in the Quran. Obviously, most Muslims in the world believe that jihad is a personal form of self-discipline in a similar way to the way Christians might see fasting and prayer. But a, a significant 
percentage of Muslims in the world, could be up to seven, maybe 10%, believe that jihad is a military command, that Muslims are required by God to slaughter those who refuse to submit to Allah the way the Quran requires. So, you know, given all of that, are, are we really looking at the same God? In light, of, in light of current events, of what took place in the nation state of Israel on the 7th of October, what is it about Islam? Not that Christians are completely innocent historically. Christians that suffered from theological and biblical myopia back in the day, uh, through the Middle Ages and so forth, and even some of the elements of the Crusades, uh, Christians are not completely innocent of shedding innocent blood. We are not. However, the Christians that did engage in activities that were counterintuitive to the written word of God, that in itself speaks accolades to the fact that they were actually living, in, to, according to standards, outside the elements of the word, which means what? They countered, they sinned. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, the, the quintessential commandment. What is it about the writings in the Quran and Islam that facilitates what we have seen around the world, not just in the past couple of decades, but historically since 600 AD. What is it? What is this violent, undergirded motif that stems out of Islam currently impacting our geopolitical reality? Yeah, Sam, this is, this is a super important point. There are people who name the name of Jesus who do exactly the opposite of what Jesus said. Right. right. And, and we need to acknowledge that that's not true Christianity. That's right. Uh, the, the story with Islam is, as, as you mentioned, more complicated. So Muhammad was very concerned in his day about polytheism. There are all these people worshiping all these different gods. There's no coherence to it. And so he believed that he had received this revelation from the angel Gabriel. He wrote it all down and then began to go around the world trying to persuade people that this is correct. There is one God, his name is Allah, and we worship him through these five pillars. And you know that's stuff you can find on the internet. That's not hard to find. But throughout his life, he became more and more frustrated. And the revelations that he said he received from Gabriel became more and more intense. It, to the point where later on in the Quran, and by the way, Jews are mentioned in the Quran, oh man, probably close to a hundred times. And by the time they get toward the end, it's like, you know what? Slaughter them. Here's, here's actually an actual quote from the Quran. The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his apostle and strive to make mischief in the land is only this, that they should be murdered or crucified or their hands and their feet should be cut off on opposite sides or they should be imprisoned. Jeff, I'm going to interject here for a moment. You're telling me, you quoted the Quran, that what took place on October 7, 2023, is in complete alignment with the writings in the Quran. Yes. So there, there are two different trajectories here. In, in the Christian Bible, we see in the Old Testament that God permitted all, you know, different things that people look back and say, wow, that's pretty rough. I mean, he commanded them to go kill all of these people. Now, some of it's the way the battle reports are written in the Old Testament. People always wrote battle reports the way people write sports articles today. You know, the Cowboys are crushed. <laughs> them. So it's like, really, they crushed them? That's rude. You know, that, but that's how they wrote the battle reports. But then you get to the New Testament where Jesus says, love God, love your neighbor, um, serve, that you, if you want to be the first, you must be the very last and the servant of all. The Quran actually goes the opposite direction. It starts out kind of nice and then ends up really mean. And the core hmm. principle among Muslim theologians today is what's called abrogation, that the later writings of Muhammad, if there, if there is a contradiction between the early writings and the later ones, you choose the later ones, which are the, the meaner ones. So yes, Sam, it, as hard as this is to say, the slaughter of Jews um, is considered by the people who took part in the slaughter to be perfectly consistent with Islam with the teachings of Islam as written in the Quran and as practiced in Sharia law, which is the manifestation of God as interpreted by legal scholars in Islam over the centuries. So Ken, we're not going to fix this through some sort of political two-state solution, what's happening in Israel, since the people surrounding Israel adhere to a worldview, back to the worldview element, that speaks to the slaughter 
of the very community right there in the middle of it. I mean, it's just illogical for us to look at a geopolitical solution for an issue that is embedded in a worldview. We would have to extract a worldview from all the nations around Israel in order to solidify in perpetuity peace and security for the nation state of Israel. Here we go. I would, I would say that, that um, Muslims do worship someone who is in the Bible. Because when you look at scripture, Christianity, the Lord God is all about freedom and responsibility. You have the freedom to make a choice and you'll suffer the consequences from the choice that you've, that you've made. Islam is all about control, tyranny, and power. How can I control others for my own use, right? Well, so I would say Allah is in the Bible, we just call him Satan. And now when the Muslims come to shoot me, this is the kill zone right here. So, you know, you guys don't shoot very well, so try not to miss. Like, just get me there so we can just, I can get straight to heaven. Don't, don't be hitting me all over here. Hence daring faith. Yeah, Hence daring, daring faith. faith. You just said that. You just <laughs> literally said that. But you, you really believe that there is no grammatical nomenclature derivative ontological extension of Allah to frame it in the context of the Arabic word for God. You believe Allah is a completely different personality, et cetera, et cetera. I believe Allah is Satan. I believe Satan has always wanted to be worshiped and he deceived Muhammad and he described himself. This is me as your God. And he's deceived 2 billion people. Justice Grant going. Jeff, I don't want to get Jeff, too close to Harrison. Say something, Jeff, say something. It, these are these are tough questions. I mean, people disagree about this and good people disagree about how all of this is done. Most Muslims in the world are not going to speak against the Palestinian actions as represented by their government, this terrorist organization called Hamas. They won't speak against it primarily because Islam is a communitarian sort of religion. It's based on Ummah, which is the global community of Muslims. Jeff, I'm going to interject. I have to interject. Ken, hold on. Jeff, devil's advocate or redemptive advocate, no devil's advocate here. I've had conversations when, when I used to advise a previous presidential administration in the White House. I, I had access. I went to Ramallah, uh, spoke to Muslim leaders. Some of the, full disclosure, some of the best hospitality, so help me, I've ever received, I received from a Muslim capitalist in the West Bank who opened up his doors to yours truly and my wife, an incredible man, a genuine uh, Authentic spirit, meaning just loving, caring, compassionate, full of empathy. Uh, had it, well, And then we hear how charity and compassion and opening your doors of your home are part of the Muslim. Which is it, Jeff? I'm so confused right now. Is it the, the Islamic religion of Muhammad 2.0? who is angry, who's def who definitely wasn't a pacifist. Let's just compare and contrast Mohammed with Jesus. Like Mohammed, even before the Quran, who was Mohammed? Talk to me about his relationships, uh, his marriages, and so forth. Give me that. And compared to like born in a manger, carpenter's son, never harmed, a, you know, an, an, an ant and a cockroach for crying out loud, died on a cross. Compare and contrast, please. Which is it? I, I think I think you're what you're what you're referring to is one of the core pillars of Islam, which is charity. It, hospitality is is a core virtue. To not show hospitality is 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 awful. It's it's a sin in Islam. However, you have this percentage of people in the world, and it is probably two hundred million people who believe that waging war against Christians and Jews is required by the Quran and the rest of the Muslim world will not speak against why them not because it's community because it's a it's communitarian you know it, 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 it most if you've got a Republican who's super hardcore Republican they're not going to speak against the presidential candidate no matter how many places they disagree because it is their party's candidate so in, in, a, in, a, in a much more intensive very personal way that's what happens 
in the world of Islam. So Allah is, if you were to read an Arabic translation of scripture, Allah is the word for God. But, you know, as, as Ken, you mentioned at the outset of the show, Satan, Satan's a liar. He didn't go to Eve in the garden and say, hey, I'm going to tell you a lie, and I hope that you believe me. He said, what God has said to you is a lie, and I am telling you the truth. So either there are different gods being worshipped or um, Islam is worshipping the one true God, but worshipping him falsely based on this this revelation of uh, in the Quran, which is not biblical. Ken, we're, we're going to, this is, this is going to spill over into episode two, maybe three and four, worldviews, Christian cults and parasites. What's your last word? It's important that we know what the lies are so that we can be stronger in the truth. And this is so valuable and so important that we understand what's what, so that not only can we be solid in our faith, but that we can also help correct those who are going wrong. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to the next episode because we'll continue on the Muslim thing and then get a little bit into the, the trendy, cool Buddhist thing, which if you live in Portland, Oregon, you're a Buddhist, you don't even know what that means. But we're going to get to that too. Brilliant. Next more minute, I'd love to jump in about Go ahead. something. Go. Please. Please. What we're seeing in Israel right now versus Palestine is, 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 is an unprecedented thing in the Muslim world. So there are two different strains of Islam. One says that is the, the correct way to r run the religion is by going back to a direct descendant of Muhammad. The other one is, no, we just sort of pay attention to the way that things were done. So you have Sunni versus Shia. The people in Iran who are funding what is going on in Palestine are Shia. The people in Palestine are Sunni. These two groups never get along. They never get along. The only thing they have in common is a complete and total hatred of Israel because it is God's chosen people. Next episode, we need, we're required to begin with the whole dichotomy. Is it Ishmael versus Isaac? Is that our current reality? This is Daring Faith. That's Ken Harrison, Sam Rodriguez, the Honorable Dr. Jeff from the summit in beautiful Colorado in some hippie town. <laughs> it's not Berkeley. Sometimes it does smell like Berkeley. Let's do one thing together, Daring Faith. Let's go change the world.